Good morning. I'm Jim Shelton. I want to welcome you to the Marchfield Air Museum. Today we're going to be talking about the SR-71. I was fortunate enough to have flown it for six years. I flew, started flying in August of 1968 through June of 1974, and I have over 911 hours in the aircraft. Now, one thing that makes this aircraft different than others, um, you're in this full pressure suit, so you don't do a pre-flight of the airplane. What happens is that we're in what's called physiological support division, or short PSD, where we're having a high protein diet of steak and eggs, high protein, low residue. And while we're having our breakfast, the crew chief comes in, he brings the forms, he sits across the table from you, he looks you in the eye and describes the discrepancies from the previous flight and all the correction action he's taken and he looks you right in the eye and said the airplane's ready to go. So we have a good bond between crew members and maintenance because we trust what they do. Then you go into the PSD suiting up, put you in the full pressure suit, and so when you're from, the, from PSD, you go to a van, van drives you out to the airplane, you climb up in the airplane so we don't have any walk around pre-flight of that. But at this point, I'll go over to the airplane and we'll go ahead and discuss some of the items that um, are on the airplane. And uh, you get a notice here, the, the pedo boom, the static pedo boom sticking out in front of the airplane. That has to be out here so that it gets the fresh air to go ahead and give us airspeed indication. It also tells the nav set how fast it's going. And there's a little jog on the side, which is called the alpha beta probe. And there's a little, little, uh, two little uh, ports that are vertical and two are on the horizontal plane. The vertical one is the uh, alpha, tells the angle of attack, and the side ones tell you if you're in a side slip, the beta indicated. That all feeds into the different computers. There's a navigation computer, there's the air inlet computer that helps drive the uh, inlets to get us out to the Mach 3. Because this airplane was designed to fly at three times the speed of sound. Also, the makes this a kind of unusual airplane. You get up here, this is composite material. There's a little metal along here, but up here is a composite material, and this is all, com this is all composite here. Now they have two different noses. There's a separation joint right at this particular spot, and they can put a different nose on the airplane. This one happens to be just a blank nose but they have a radar, an aperture radar, that gives you almost perfect black and white pictures. So I knew when we flew over North Vietnam and the weather was bad, we were still picking up, uh, could identify the ships in Haiphong Harbor with the radar only. They also have a camera nose on here that is just what I call the garbage collector it goes from side to side for a thousand miles and just picks up everything in there. It's called the optical bar camera, but they make the different nose depending on what the mission is. And as we go back further, this is still composite material on the airplane. You can kind of hear it because um, it's the first airplane that ever had any kind of stealth capability built into it. The radar signal on this airplane is smaller than an F-104, which is a very small airplane. Some of the other things that gives it a radar, and when you look back at the rudder there, you'll notice it leans in. The rudder tips in so that the radar signal doesn't bounce off of that. So it has, it's the first aircraft that had stealth capability um, built into it. But the composites go on down and then you finally get into the section where the camera equipment and the other, um, they have cameras, they've got the capability for picking up electronic signals. We would do that around the periphery of China, find out where all the 
radars were located on China with that, <coughs> it could go ahead and collect the radar signal and give you a good cut. When you talk about 35 miles a minute, you get a couple of minutes worth, you've gone 60 or 80 miles this way, it gives you a good cut to locate where that SAM radar site is. Then um, there's composite material all the way down the aircraft. Again, you can, you can hear this. You move over. This is a piece of composite material also on here. The uh, spike is not. It's a nice, nice stainless steel point out here. Now this is the real secret on what this airplane, what gives this airplane the capability to fly at three times the speed of sound for hours and hours. The front part um, of this, now as you go, go faster and you start to go supersonic at about 1.6 Mach, the spike now starts to go back inside because they want to capture the supersonic shock wave down inside the inlet at this particular particular point. So you want the biggest opening, so at Mach 3, 3.2 Mach actually, this spike is back in the hole 26 inches. They're capturing this supersonic shock wave. The shock wave compresses and then right at the back end there are doors in here that position the shock wave and keep it in its proper position. Right at the back of the shock wave, the pressure drops off quickly because the jet engine can only take subsonic air, not supersonic air. So now we have this 3.2 air coming in, and when the pressure drops, this actually creates forward thrust and creates about 70% of our thrust at that particular time. Now if we move over to the engine, All right, this is the face of, face of the engine. This is where the air has to be subsonic. And so when you're at Mach 3.2, the air gets in through the guide vanes, but now you'll notice there are these large tubes that go around the engine to take air from the front, transfer it right to the, to the afterburner of this engine, creating like a ramjet. So the ramjet aspects, this produce about 30%. The basic engine itself at Mach 3.2 is only putting out about 15% of the thrust when you're out there at Mach 3.2. The biggest part is the inlet. Then comes the bypass air going into the afterburner section back here, creating the ramjet effect. And uh, you can keep this engine in the afterburner position the whole time you're supersonic. This engine gets glowing red hot in the airplane. They've got some uh, pictures on, done on test stands with the engine where it's glowing red hot. Well, the same thing happens when it's inside the cowlings on this airplane. So the airplane is, I think it's about 85% titanium. Titanium, light metal, can uh, withstand the heat. Now the, the openings you see up at the top up here by the, by the numbers, that's where the bypass air that uh, the doors hold that supersonic shock wave in its proper position. They, when they open, they bypass the air to the outside right here. Let's talk a little bit about the, the tires. This is another unusual feature. The tire itself looks like it's, it's shot, but actually it has 21 cords um, in each tire, and in about cord number 15 is a red one. So once you see the red cord, the tire needs to be replaced. Because of the heat, that's built up in this airplane, you can't have a very thick rubber tire 
like a KC-135 or 747, what you have is many layers of cord and a little bit of rubber between each cord. Also inside there's a can when the gear goes up this way the tires are inside of a can so if they overheat or were to um, blow there it's not going to wipe out the hydraulic lines inside the wheel well. These tires are filled with nitrogen in fact, there's no compressed air on the airplane at all. There's dry nitrogen is put in the tires, a uh, maximum of 425 pounds of nitrogen in there. Um, <clears throat> step over a little, little bit. Um, I'm beating on a fuel tank right now. This, the round center body of this is fuel. Starting right up, right past the uh, navigator station, all the way to the tip end is fuel. There's also fuel out in the wing area up to the engine. It holds 80,000 pounds of fuel when it's completely full. There are stories about the fuel or leaking fuel on the ground. Part of the problem Lockheed had was that because this aircraft, there are spots on the aircraft that reach upwards of, um, varies from about 500 degrees Fahrenheit on backwards at the tail end around where the engine and afterburner section are up to about 18, 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. So in order to um, seal the tanks, you can't put a bladder tank inside of this, it just it, the aircraft gets too hot. It also grows a little bit, about four to six inches when you're out at Mach 3. They Lockheed created a seal that they would put between the structure and the outer skin. Well, the sealant, they couldn't make a sealant that would work when you're subsonic, the temperature outside is minus 55, so the airplane is cold soaked. But once you start supersonic, then the temperature starts building on it because of the friction. Well, they couldn't make a, a sealant that would operate at the higher ends as well at the lower ends. So they, they moved it more towards the hot end, so when it is out there at Mach 3, you're not leaking fuel. But when you get on the ground, it does leak a little bit. And um, there was one time that I had to land at uh, Mountain Home in the middle of the night. They said, the only hangar we have for you is a uh, fuel cell hangar, new F4 fuel cell hangar. So I parked the airplane in there and the student and I, it was a trainer airplane, the student and I go to bed. The next morning, the maintenance people are out there and uh, it was a generator problem. So they had to start an engine because they didn't know if it was a generator or the, con the connection between the generator and the engine. Well, the base commander's driving by and he's asking, what's that dripping off the airplane? And they said, oh, that's just fuel. And he said, well, wait a minute, that's fuel and you're gonna start this thing up. He said, not in my hangar, you're not. All he could think about was the hangar was gonna burn down. So he made the maintenance men stop what they were doing get the airplane out, tow it out on the ramp, then start the engine, because he just knew that this thing was going to blow up. However, it has special fuel, JP-7 it's called, which has a very high flash point. You can take a blowtorch to it and it won't ignite it. So it's, it's from that standpoint, it's a safe fuel, and a little bit of fuel on the ground um, the only problem it creates is it eats the way the boots of the maintenance man. This is one of the, the camera bays along here. It's difficult to see, but right here is the, would be the opening for the window to go ahead where the camera can look down. And let's go over and take a look at the, the camera over here. This is quite a unique camera. It fits up in there. When you get around here, it's got a mirror on it. And this is the brain of the camera because Keep in mind, when you're traveling 3,100 feet per second, 
if you want to get a picture that's not blurred, you got to keep the camera pointed at the single spot. So the nav set provides a computer with the speed, or the camera with the speed, and this mirror then moves back and forth so ever slowly, whatever it takes, based on the airplane speed, to hold your view spot on the ground so you don't have a blurred picture. So as you're flying along taking pictures, this camera is going back and forth like this, holding your view right at the same spot on the ground as you're traveling along 3,100 feet per second. Well, it's quite a, a unique camera. And um, one time I saw kind of a gee whiz photo where um, a young boy was playing soccer in a field in North Vietnam, and I could see his leg was up and the ball had just come off of his leg, which was just kind of a gee whiz photo that they blew up to pass around to show people. The other time when I flew the Middle East mission, um, I saw the photos that the intelligence people were taking around briefing the different staff at the Pentagon because um, they were, Americans were required to um, replace lost equipment for the Egyptians during the 73 Yom Kippur War. Well, they, would, they used our photos then from this camera to go ahead and say, yeah, there's a, there's a tank that's been destroyed because either they could, you could see the black soot coming out from it, the track would be off, or the gun turret would be gone from it. So the intelligence people were going around counting the dead tanks and equipment because we were going to go ahead and replace those after the Yom Kippur War. We'll go around this time and just take a look at the back of the airplane. One thing about this, this airplane, it doesn't have any slats for leading it, edge lift, or flaps for um, to help you slow down. It comes down finally at about 175 knots indicated, goes ahead, and within ground effect, the lower body of this thing is like a lifting body. And you can get right down and touch down on the runway at about 150 knots. Um, you can actually pull the power back if you have enough energy coming around down final. You could pull the power back to idle two or three miles away from the end of the runway and it will come down and make a nice smooth touchdown on the, on the runway. There are open doors in the back end back here. Um, they go ahead and once you start supersonic, they will close up. The uh, afterburner is going. And the outside nozzles, once you're out of Mach 3, they, they are opened up this way. And I, because of the airflow going through and whatnot, does create a little bit of thrust. About 10, 15 percent of the thrust is created by these nozzles. They're not controlled. They're pressure controlled based on the, the air going past the outside and the jet um, blast coming through the uh, through the engine itself. The back end of the airplane, there's a, a um, dump in case you need to um, land quickly because of emergency and you have too much fuel on board, you can go ahead and dump the fuel out the back end. Um, we used to do that as a um, on training flights over to Okinawa. We came close enough to the island, and um, so the pilot then, as he got next to the island, would go ahead and dump a little bit of fuel, and you could see this streak, and it's, I mean, it's a big streak, really moving along when you go in Mach 3 out there and you dump a little bit of fuel out the back end. And uh, supposedly one of the times, the uh, one of the pilots decided he would let the North Vietnamese know that he was over there, so he dumped a little bit of fuel coming out the back. And it's quite impressive when you're on the ground, and it's up at 80,000 feet, and you see this little contrail up there that's just moving along very rapidly.
from back here you can see that the rudders are tipped in and like I say when you're down on the ground and the radar is shooting up you've got the wing out here and and the rudders tipped in so it doesn't create a, a place for the radar signal to bounce off of where if it's perfectly ver vertical it might stick up above and you get a little bit more radar return so like i say this is the first airplane that that was designed with any kind of stealth capability in mind and that was one of the requirements for the airplane the whole back edge on both sides of the airplane um, when you want it when you pull back on the stick all four sections go up if you want to make a turn when you put the stick to the side to make a turn one goes up and the other one comes down making the airplane turn there so there's no there's no flap or anything on the back side of the aircraft for safety's sake every other hydraulic ram in here is powered by either the left engine or the right engine so it goes um, you have in case you were to lose an engine you still have enough rams every other ram to go ahead and move the flight control surfaces so you can land the airplane the last airplane that they lost finally the odds caught up with it. They were on a operational mission off of the coast of China near the um, tip end of the Philippines and all of a sudden they lost the engine. The engine blew up at Mach 3 so the pilots controlling it very good coming on down they're running their emergency procedures checklist so he's lost one hydraulic system because the engine now blew up so that hydraulic pump is not working so they're they're headed towards Taiwan to go ahead and make an emergency landing there on the one engine. Well, they get down about 15,000 feet, and now the other hydraulic system gets them gives them a quantity low light, indicating that they were losing hydraulic fluid on the one good hydraulic system they had left. So what had happened when the engine blew? It happened to hit one of the lines on the good engine. And so that engine was just pumping hydraulic fluid out. So when they got down about 15,000 feet, the pilot said, there's no way I can control it anymore and we can't land. So they eject out of the airplane. And when you hear the navigator talk about it coming down, he said he looked up and looking up at the airplane and he said, that damn thing's gonna hit me. Well, it didn't, it fell off in the ocean. They get picked up by some fishermen off the, off of the end of um, the Philippines and uh, they're starting in and pretty soon the fishermen decided to go further south uh, around and they asked well why did you do that and he said because the Taliban controls that end of the island we want to go move it on down to a safer spot to let you off so they they were picked up come back and that's that particular navigator um, went on was over in Europe uh, in a very nice promotable position and when they reactivated the airplanes in March of 1990 it formally retired this accident happened in a and it was uh, October November of 89 they formally retired the airplane in March of 90 so he's on his way over in Europe and enjoying himself well finally Congress told the Air Force to bring some airplanes back and so in 1993, I think it was, he got a call and said, do you want to come back and fly? And he was so eager, he said, you bet. Even though he had jumped out of one of them already, he was eager to get back and fly again. Okay, just back right over here, you can barely see a window. That's for the star tracker that updates the nav set. The nav set is there. The next opening you see is the air refueling receptacle where we'll come up under a KC-135 and then the boomer inserts the boom at that particular point. Um, we do get the nose of the airplane just up under 
the KC-135. And we did have an accident for some reason, um, but it was up underneath the um, KC-135, and some sporadic input to his control surface pitched the airplane up it knocked the nose off of the airplane. It hit the elevator on the KC-135, and all Buddy remembers was that the instrument panel was crushing in around him. He ejected. He ended up breaking both ankles. His back seater ejected, so they came out. They came out fine. It scared the devil out of the tanker pilot because he said he had his hands on the control wheel itself, but it knocked it when Buddy's airplane hit his elevator it had such great force it knocked the flight control wheel out of his hands uh, but the tanker came back fine but had a great big dent in the uh, elevator where he had lost it when you look down you'll see some kind of ripples in the top part of the wing down here those are more for heat expansion as this thing expands it grows as a engineers calculated about three to four inches and also in length, but a couple of inches in width. So that helps take care of the expansion in it. Inside, the fuel lines all have bellows in it to go ahead and take care of this expansion and contraction due to the heat of the airplane. Um, sitting in the cockpit at this particular time, a lot of people say, well, how could you see out? Because they're trying to look out just this little bit of window here. But once you close the canopy, you have another bar and you still have glass here. It's sort of like looking between your side window and the windshield of your car. So it's, you're, you're not focused just looking out the front windows. You are this way when you're air refueling. You're coming up underneath the tanker, you're kind of leaning forward. The seat is down low like it is now, and so you're looking up at the tanker. And the only way you see the tanker is looking out through the window. Everybody had their own little technique of when they were in position. Um, on the bottom of the tanker was a water drain, and for myself, I found that if I, if I used that as a hook and just visually hooked the windscreen right here into that little tube coming out of the bottom of the KC-135, I was in perfect position. The normal instruments are set up, your attitude indicator, your uh, situation here with heading and whatnot. Um, this particular instrument is different. What we had was a moving map projector at this particular point. Now here you have a standby attitude indicator and so they're right on top of each other so it's very easy to see if this one is giving you bad information you get a quick backup at this particular point. This, The upper one up here is the angle of attack you have to watch that, and like I say, we normally flew it at, at uh, six or seven degrees nose up. You have your normal airspeed indicator. However, it does get up to Mach 3.2, which most airplanes don't go that high. You have an altimeter on the other side, uh, vertical velocity here. So this is your flight attitude instruments right here. This, the only airplane, has a triple display indicator because we were interested in equivalent airspeed, this gives us indicated airspeed, this gives us equivalent airspeed, and altitude, as you can see, this one happens to be run up to 70,000 feet, um, but Mach gives you Mach down to the 100. I remember on a training mission, it was a 10 and a half hour training mission, I was told to fly at Mach 3. Well, at Mach 3.01, I'd make a power change. At 2.99, I'd make another power change. Well, I was chasing that so much, trying to keep it exactly at Mach 3.0, that I wore myself out in 10 and a half hours. So when they asked me to do the 11, 11 hour and 20 minute mission, I said, I'm gonna have to pace myself. Well, at that particular time, I didn't chase it. If it got up to finally 3.05, I'd make a power change. If it dropped down to 2.95, then I'd push the power up a little bit instead of trying to chase it at Mach 3. On the right-hand side, you've got your normal engine instruments, uh, RPM, exhaust gas temperature. You've got two fire lights in case you do have some kind of an engine fire. These would come out red. Then you've got your... Um, 
nozzle engine nozzle positions here then you've got fuel flow and oil pressure so these are standard instruments for any airplane you have your hydraulic pressure we've got uh, the um, hydraulic number one system and number two system you move on over and this is the fuel it'll hold a total of 80,000 pounds of fuel uh, you've got a center of gravity indicator here. You've got um, the different fuel tanks, um, fuel tank uh, pressure here. Um, the liquid nitrogen now, didn't talk about liquid nitrogen, but as the fuel goes down in a tank, and you're out there at Mach 3 and the airplane is so hot, you don't want to have oxygen in your tank as you're coming down because it could create an explosion. So we have liquid nitrogen doers on board. There's 200 gallon liquid nitrogen doers on board that pump nitrogen in as the gas goes down in the tank, then nitrogen fills that void. Um, you use a lot of it because now you've, you void the tank of fuel and it's full of nitrogen you come up underneath the tanker and all of a sudden you're going to fill that tank up back with fuel so the nitrogen goes out the back end of the airplane so um, for that 11 hour and 20 minute mission they put an extra 50 gallon doer inside the airplane and that uh, to make sure that you always had enough nitrogen to make these climbs and descends then you have um, you can turn on the different fuel pumps. It sequences automatically, but in case uh, the center of gravity starts to get off a little bit um, and you kind of want to check your tanks, you can go ahead and activate a tank. Now, any aircraft, as you change speeds, the center of gravity, when you're, I'm talking about supersonic aircraft, um, the center of gravity changes. So. The center of gravity moves aft as we go supersonic, but as we get ready to come down, we've got to get the center of gravity forward. So there's a, uh, a switch down here. It's a, it's a spring-loaded switch that you hold your finger on. will transfer fuel from the back end of the airplane to the front of the airplane, getting ready for landing. Over here, we've got um, battery. We've got emergency fuel dump. You notice it's got a red guard. Car, red guard over it is because you don't want to go around dumping your fuel out. Um, you've got generators down here. Now we move to the other side and I talked about the inlet being very important since it's a thrust creator. Um, normally works automatically. We have a spike indicator here. We've got door opening here. Um, and here then we've got manual controls. If the automatic feature does not work, we can control the spike manual. And these are based, based on basically the Mach. As you go up, see it starts out at 1.4, 1, 1 it starts, but at 1.6, when the, mic, the spike starts going back, you can go ahead and control it, manually control it on up to 3.2. Then you also have the doors there. You can position the doors. You're not gonna get as efficient uh, use using manual switches but you can fly the airplane because if something happened and you you're still over the denied area you don't want to slow up to subsonic speed because then the bad guys will shoot you down but you can go ahead and control and so this will get you a rough setting in there um, so that you can go ahead and leave the area once you get out of the area then you're, uh, then you could go ahead and slow down and talk about possibly landing someplace. Um, down on the center section, now these are all warning lights. Um, basically right engine, left engine, and general uh, indications here. So you can see there's an awful lot of um, possible um, emergencies you could have in there and there's a master warning light up here so whenever one of these comes on you'll see it while you're keeping your eyes in the flight instruments here you'll see this comes on then you can glance down and see what the particular problem is 
down here. Uh, gear handle over to the left. The drag chute handle here. Um, it's electrically controlled. You just reach up, pull it, pull it this way, and then when you're on the runway and before, since the drag chute compartment is well before the back end of the airplane, you want to get uh, jettison the chute while you've got at least 50 knots so that the the metal hasp will clear the airplane. Then you just you turn it and it jettisons it. Um, typical two throttles on the left. It was nice. I had, one time I was in the B40 in the B40 B47 program and I had to learn to fly again because I came from the F86 which is stick between your leg and a throttle at the left. The B47 has a control wheel and six throttles on the right. So it took me a little bit of transition, but it was sure nice to get back into an airplane with a stick here. On the right hand side, you've got um, radios, um, the IFF uh, interrogate friendly or foe, which sends out a signal so that the ground control people know um, where you are. But of course, operational missions, you turn that off. Later MRF versions of the airplane had a light in the back that created a horizontal line across the um, instrument panel and across the airplane. So at nighttime, it was really nice because you had this line on there which uh, gave you what the actual horizon was. Because there's sometimes that you're out there and all you can, you know, if you're in the clouds or something of that nature, you're just relying totally on your attitude indicator here to tell you which, which way is up and which way is down. And um, once in a while you will get, I remember one time refueling over the northern lights. So you had northern lights flickering to your left, total black out to the right, and I kept thinking I was turning, even though I was straight and level hooked onto the tanker. but it, it felt like I was going straight up and turning at the same time. So this extra horizontal line that was in the cockpit helped eliminate that uh, feelings of um, losing control of the airplane. There are typical instrument panel, uh, circuit breaker panels on either, either side of the airplane. They used to, when I started, try to train you and depending on the system, the navigator would read the, you want to be the fifth circuit breaker back, row three or four. Well, I found that I couldn't quite do all that, so I just grabbed my baler bar on my helmet, twisted my head around, and could look at the circuit breakers to see if they were out. There's circuit breakers on either, either side there. One of the things I didn't talk about was the, um, I talked about the fuel needed such a high flash point. Well, um, they use triethylborane, which when it hits oxygen or air, it creates a very high flash at that particular point. Each engine has 16 shots. There's a little indicator down here by the throttle. So one shot starts the engine when you want to light the afterburner is a second shot. Then any, any other time if the afterburner blows out, it's another shot. So you have 16 shots, so you have to, uh, you can't waste them on long missions because every time you come down and that 11 hour and 20 minute mission, there were six refuelings. So that was six times I had to start the afterburner, relight the afterburner. So that was six shots. <coughs> Uh, one shot on takeoff would be seven, starting up would be eight. So, you know, I'd already used half of them, and then if you had any kind of engine problems and the afterburner blew out, you would have, you would have used uh, more. So you have to worry about the limitation on your tab. You had to use that judiciously. Now, this airplane, typical stick, transmit, you want to transmit, um, nose wheel steering button, but what makes this one different 
is the fact that when you're Mach 3 and you lose an engine, there's a terrific, terrific amount of yaw put in there. Most airplanes have pitch and roll, up and down for pitch, side to side for roll. This one has yaw, so if you lose that engine, you push on the rudder pedal and you go ahead and get as much help as you can by uh, pushing on the button up at this particular point. Roll was over here on the side, just a little electrical switch, so we weren't that concerned about the roll. We were more concerned about the thrust, the difference in thrust when you have um, 34,000 pounds of thrust on one engine and nothing on the other, the airplane will turn away from the, it'll turn into the bad engine. So that's where it, why they decide to put yaw control up here on the stick. Um, I talked about that 11 and a half or 11 hour and 20 minute mission over the Middle East. Um, it started out, we were to go from Beale Air Force Base up through refuel in Canada, refuel in Portugal, go through the Mediterranean, refuel by the island of Crete, go down to Suez, uh, continuing around, make a right 270 degree turn around Cairo, come back across the, uh, the battle area on the Israeli and Egyptian side there, and then go back and uh, refuel at Crete, and then recover in England. It was going to be an eight and a half hour mission. Well, they send the maintenance crew um, to go ahead and recover the, the aircraft in England. Well, once the maintenance crew landed, the British said, you can't recover here. We rely so heavily on Middle East oil, we don't want to get uh, accused of supporting your mission in any way, so you can't recover here. So they canceled the mission that night. We're in, we're in there getting the final briefing, and we canceled the, they canceled the mission. They said, well, go home. Come back the next day, and we'll see what they're going to do. Well, it just so happened that um, at uh, Griffiths Air Force Base in Rome, New York, happened to have a tank car of our JP-7 on the, on the siding there because the... Um, Palmdale test airplane was going to come up in another week and do some flying out of there for a while doing some kind of electronic checking that they were going to do and there was also a Lockheed recovery team there um, so the um, reconnaissance center asked SAC can you fly from Rome New York through the Middle East back to Rome, New York, and so instead of an eight and a half hour mission, it went to 11 hours and 20 minutes. Well, we go ahead, we fly into Rome, New York, recover, sleep, get ready, get ready for the mission. Well, our mission then was the same route, but we went subsonic from Rome, New York, tied into the air refueling point in Canada, and went through Portugal, uh, on through the Med, Crete, back Crete, then backtracked Portugal, back to Canada, and then came back to Rome, New York. Well, as we're coasting in, um, going down the Suez, uh, the navigator tells me that the Egyptian surfaced air missiles are tracking us. Now, we didn't do anything when they were tracking. Uh, so I said, okay, and it brought back memories that the intelligence briefing that we'd gotten a couple of days before at Beale, the intelligence officer said, don't be surprised if the Egyptians or the Israelis shoot at you because we haven't told anybody you're coming. So that gave me a comforting, comforting feeling. Well, after I came out, uh, they could only track us. They, they tracked us for a short period of time, made our 270 degree loop around Cairo. And as I came back, I'm looking down and saw some contrails. And I wasn't sure if they were Egyptian or Israeli airplanes coming up. Um, later in 1974 then, in summer of 74, we were allowed to take the SR-71 to the Farnborough Air Show. While, they were, while we were setting up the airplane for static display there, um, I found a fella looking in the nose wheel well of the airplane and I told him back back and in very broken English he said tell me about the Middle East flights 
And of course, at that time, everything was classified. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, don't bullshit me. I'm a MiG-21 squadron commander from Egypt. And so he could have been one of the contrails I saw down there at that particular time, but I couldn't talk to him at all about the mission in any, any way, shape, or form about that particular mission. <coughs> But that was probably the most interesting mission um, that I had. Um, also during that mission was the first time I had ever taken any kind of tube food. I had two tubes of apricot. Now in our full pressure suit, we had a little feed port that we could go ahead and push up and insert plastic tube. And we had a water bottle hooked to it. Or in this particular case, I had the uh, apricot well, I go ahead and the apricot is like a tube of toothpaste. It had a little seal at the end and when you screwed on this plastic tube that went in through your face port, um, once you made the final turn in the tube, it would break that seal and then you could have access to the apricot and you'd squeeze the tube and squeeze the apricot in your mouth. Well, I forgot that we were flying along and cabin pressure at 80,000 feet is 26,000 feet. Well, I forgot this tube was built, was created at sea level. So I go ahead and I break the seal, and all of a sudden I've got apricots spewing out as the pressure is trying to equalize from sea level to 26,000 feet. So I'm trying to put the tube in my pocket so I don't have apricot all over the place. Well, I lost about a third of the tube before I could get it in my mouth. The second one, I was a little smarter. I started screwing the tube in, then inserted it, made the final break so that all I, I got full benefit from the apricot instead of having to put it in my pocket. Now, let's go ahead and the SR-71 push for technology. Um, the initial goal, of course, was Mach 3, 80,000 feet, low res, uh, RCS. Well, it started in 1958. They were doing studies at that particular time. They had the U-2 flying and studies indicated that the Russians had created a surface-to-air missile that could shoot down the U-2. So they did some um, calculations and said, well, if you're at 80,000 feet and three times the speed of sound, the missiles cannot shoot you down. So they started designing what we call the Blackbird family. So it started with the A-12, which was a CIA-funded program. They created 15 of these and they were, they were housed out at Groom Lake, uh, Area 51 in Nevada. They took three of the 15 and modified them. One they made a trainer out of. They took the camera. Now, it was a single pilot airplane. Right behind the pilot, where we have a second station for navigator, they had a big camera that looked straight down. So they took the camera out and put a second pilot station in that particular airplane for training purposes. And they didn't put this new, this um, J-58 engine in the airplane, so it was a Mach 2 airplane. It's currently on static display uh, at the Science Museum here in Los Angeles. Then they took two others and modified, took the camera out and put a drone operator station in it and mounted a D-21 drone on top. Now, um, in 19, May of 1960 is when Gary Powers got shot down. At that particular time, they said no more overflights of Russia. But they were going to use the drone to go ahead and go over, fly the drone over China. They needed it on top of the SR-70 or the A-12 because it was a <clears throat> ramjet engine and it needed to be up to about 2.8 Mach before the engine would start. So they mounted on back of the A-12. They had two of those. Well, that, uh, that program lasted until they, they were doing a firing or separation, and the drone came up and came back down and hit the airplane, and the uh, Lockheed test pilot, Bill Park, in the back seater jumped out over Point Magoo uh, range out there in the ocean. Uh, the back seater, unfortunately, drowned um, there, but Bill came out all right. But at that time, then Kelly said that program, they'll kill that program. 
They ultimately put it on a B-52, but it needed to rocket below it to get the missile up in altitude and speed so that the engine would start on it. It wasn't a very successful program, so they killed it. But it was a growth, a basically a test growth from the CIA A-12 program. Um, <coughs> the, the other part of the family, the uh, Lockheed built three called YF-12s that were airborne interceptors. They had um, missiles on board. They had a back seat with the radar operator in the back seat and an uh, airborne radar, and their mission was going to be stationed in the northern tier, and as bombers came over the pole from Russia, they could go out to Mach 3 at 80,000 feet and shoot down, and it was very successful. However, it came along, and they built three of these. It came along at a time when the Air Defense Command was uh, decreasing. They had 102s and 106s, but uh, they were changing their mission roles, so they weren't interested in the airplane. But um, the A-12, the CIA program, flew first flew in March of 1962. Well, a little bit later that year, the Air Force said, we would like some SR-71s, multi-sensor airplanes. As I said, the, the CIA bird was single camera that looked straight down. The Air Force wanted a multi-sensor airplane, and that's where they came up with the radar, cameras, and also the backseater to go ahead and operate these things. Well, in, I guess it was about December of 62, they signed a contract for 31. It wasn't that large to begin with, but it contract ultimately went to 31 SR-71s. Because when you think of the active war, the CIA is usually a before the war situation. Once the, the hot war starts, it would become a military role then to go ahead and, and do bomb damage assessment, uh, find out what's happening on the ground, and things of that nature. So that's why the Air Force decided they wanted some SR-71s. So that's the the Blackbird family, three different types of airplanes. But by um, May of 1968, they retired the CIA birds, took all those and put those in a hangar down at, uh, at Palmdale, and the SR-71 then took over their commitment. Um, and the commitments were um, Cuba, North Vietnam, North Korea, and um, because it's a multi-sensor airplane, we could pick up the periphery of, uh, of China on that. Um, we did fly missions out of Okinawa, flying, um, taking care of the, the Far East. Uh, when it came time for Cuba, we would fly out of Beale, down Cuba. A little bit later, uh, after the Middle East mission in during the Yom Kippur War of 73, kind of opened the door and thought about flying out of Europe. Well, they ultimately set up a um, base of operation at Mildenhall, and they had two SR-71s at Mildenhall that flew all around the periphery of the uh, Iron Curtain area around the Soviet Union. Um, they got a lot of good take up around the sub-pens uh, in Russia. They could fly very close to that, get good either radar or photo graphics, and the Navy was very interested in that. So they ran those missions out of Mildenhall. They still ran some periphery of China. Um, I don't think we overflew Vietnam after about 73, maybe, was about the last time we overflew the Vietnam uh, era. So I'm not quite sure all the missions, but they had two airplanes at Okinawa up until it retired in 90, and two in Mildenhall then. Well, I really enjoyed my time talking to you about the airplane, and I certainly hope you will come out and make a trip to the museum and see the, air, see the airplane because it is a very unique aircraft. So we hope you enjoy this video and come out and see us someday.